very warm welcome a very good morning to one and all present here from all over the parts of india and all over the parts from the world so what a day it was that the legal luminaries the high dignified people has joined us together for the intellectual flows during this paradigm shift in the matter of when the we have witnessed the covid 19 situations i dr avnish pat the faculty convener along with ms ekta gelawat the faculty convener of this international webinar on the rule of law and access to justice in the age of uncertainty again warmly welcome everyone to this international webinar in which we have our your lordship justice swatan kumar sir with us honorable justice our lordships justice surekant honorable ladyship justice sabrina ma'am from united states of america our professor associate professor professor tracy hester from the united states of america we warmly welcome you on behalf of the ifa university dehradun to begin with the session i humbly request to all to join together for the lighting of the lamp and we have a virtual book a presentation so i am just uh, just sharing my screen Dean sir, whether my screen is visible? Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Surely. Yeah. So this is a virtual lighting of the lamp. So on on behalf of our uh, dignified uh, jurists present today, who uh, are all lordships, we are this uh, uh, lighting of lamp has been done virtually. now this is the the flyer for the day and now on behalf of the ikfa university all of us the host we want to give a bouquet presentation and this is a virtual flower bouquet presentation to honorable justice sadan kumar sir the virtual bouquet presentation to honorable mr justice surekant sir lordship and the virtual book of presentation to honorable lady justice uh, sabrina ma'am a virtual book of presentation to professor tacy hester sir from usa sir we all ladyship and the lordship and respected sir we again warmly welcome to all of you for this wonderful event we have joined together now to proceed and begin with the session i would be requesting honorable justice mr sutan kumar sir retired supreme court justice to request him just i would like to give a brief about our respected sir respected sir is a highly celebrated indian judge retired from supreme court sir is a former chairperson of national green tribunal and also former chief justice of bombay high court and a judge of delhi high court and punjab and haryana high court along with this sir has also been awarded with several national and international event and sir has significantly contributed in the legal field in the various capacities so it's it will take a whole year to describe what sir has done to the legal community so i've just kept it in a brief now i humbly request honorable justice swatan kumar sir for the opening address Uh, respected sir over to you uh, respected lordship as uh, justice sadan kumar sir please kindly yes can you hear me now Yes, sir. You are audible. Okay. Okay. All right. Everybody, uh, good morning from India. I am really 
happy to address this august gathering on behalf of the university the vice chancellor and the management of the university well we have the topic of rule of law and access to justice at the age of uncertainty uncertainty has become an un questionable challenge not for india but for the entire globe the two aspects that is the rule of law and access to justice are fundamental to existence of any country and particularly a country like india which has such a huge population it is mostly known and is for the democracy the democracy that we have is the essence of our constitutional mandate when in a constitutional democracy no power is absolute the constitutional authorities are established by and owe their existence to the constitution and the power they exercise flow from that same constitution in certain circumstances these powers become limited in express terms for an instance article 13 of the constitution expressly limits parliament's power of law making by making subject to the fundamental right chapter in other parts it's by necessary implication having said that when i talk of mentioning the access to justice and rule of law access to justice is expeditious as well as a justice which is available to the citizens very economically beneficial and free of restrictions rule of law as we all know is the tool we use to facilitate our endeavor to achieve justice so therefore the access to justice and rule of law are the two coins two sides of the same coin in the present circumstances where everything is under a restriction whether it is social economic political administrative or even health sector in these restrictions we have to find out ways and means of achieving this target of human progressive and sustainable development well i would like to refer to honorable mr justice suryakant as one of the finest judges of the highest court of india the supreme court of india i have the privilege of knowing his lordship from his young days not that he looks older anyway today even but i know him when he was the advocate general for the state of haryana and was a very busy counsel he progressed with each day with each hour of his profession in terms of caliber his acumen is remarkable if we talk of access to justice and rule of law put together i would like to refer to a very recent judgment of justice suryakant in 2020 in the case of anita sharma where a change of concept has changed the entire scenario of adjudicating of motor accident claim tribunal cases that is how i say the rule of law and justice can go together the interpretation given by his lordship is with regard to the test of evidence that was applicable that it was stated that it is not the criminal test of proving beyond reasonable doubt but it is should be only for the purposes of reasonable acceptance of evidence 
So that has changed the entire concept of testing the law in relation to a very common subject of our country. Mr. Justice Surikant has been a remarkable contributory to the various constitutional benches, even in the Supreme Court, for the limited time he has already spent. And mm -hmm. with the grace of God, he would see the highest ladder of our country. I really welcome you and thank you, Honorable Mr. Justice Surikan, for your kindly having accepted the invitation and agreed to participate in this webinar. We all are very grateful to you. The two other stalwarts we have from the United States of America are Justice Sabina and Tracy Hester. I would put them simply and purely as friends of India. They have been source of, you know, Tracy Hester has an advantage of being a lawyer come professor. And he has been teaching. I had the occasion to share his class and deliver a lecture where he really taught me how to deal with the students who are the pillars for tomorrow's future. Tracy, I really thank you for having come on the screen for this purpose and give light to this webinar by your expert jurisdictional comments. Justice Sabina is really a great friend and a great judge of the Hawaii. Hawaii is one of the best parts of the United States of America. She is a environmentalist judge, very sensitive to environmental protection. She has authored many great opinions having far reaching consequences. I too welcome you, Madam Justice Sabina, in this webinar and thank you for being there. Well, I needn't really say anything about the Dean, the Vice Chancellor and the other staff and faculty members who are participating, but I'm sure without their great effort, this event would not have been successful. And I do see that without the great eminent person like Justice Surikan, we would not have been able to really bring this webinar to this stature and this apiton. With these small comments, I would only say that the rule of law and access to justice is very vital, even in these critical hours and restricted hours. The role of judiciary is fundamental and it must serve the society in every possible aspect. And that is what the Chief Justice of England and Wales said, we have an obligation to continue with the work of courts as a vital public service, just as others in the public sector and in the private sector are doing. So to deliver administration of justice irrespective of the hour is the duty of the administration of justice, which I'm very happy to share that the Indian judiciary has always performed to its best, even in most critical laws. With these comments, I thank everybody and request you to proceed further, please. Uh, respected, respected Lordship, uh, thank you very much for your kind words and your intellectual lightning on the topic of the day and a welcome which you have extended towards all the guests from on your behalf. Now, I humbly request our respected Dean, Professor Dr. Yigul Kishore, former Vice Chancellor and former Registrar, National Law University, Assam, for this uh, warm welcome and for an opening address from his side. Respected Dean, sir, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Avinish Bharji. Good morning to and welcome to one and all, especially the jurists who are available today to speak on this occasion of an, an international webinar. Respected my Lord, Mr. Justice Surikant, sir, Honorable Judge, Supreme Court of India, 
ऑनरेबल लेडी जस्टिस मैडम सबरीना मैं कहना आई इफ आई एम इफ माई प्रोजेशन इज रॉन्ग आई मे बी एक्सक्यूज मैडम सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑफ हवाई यूएसए ऑनरेबल मिस्टर जस्टिस स्वतन कुमार साहब फॉर्मर जज जज सुप्रीम कोर्ट ऑफ इंडिया एंड दी चेयरमैन चेयरपर्सन ग्रीन ग्रीन एन जी टी नेशनल ग्रीन ट्रिब्यूनल प्रोफेसर डॉक्टर ट्रेसी हॉस्टर यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ हॉस्टन यूएसए डिस्टिंग्विश लॉ प्रोफेसर्स एंड लॉ प्रोफेशनल्स फ्रॉम इंडिया एंड अब्रॉड my colleagues in this university my student friends and all other distinguished guests today i am honored blessed to be there to be here uh, here in the company of great stalwarts jurist leading personalities of law in the world at this uh, point i on behalf of the ikfai law school ikfai university whole heartedly welcome uh, mr justice surikant uh, uh, sir the lordship of supreme court of india who has been very kind enough to be here with us on this occasion of an international webinar on rule of law and access to justice in the age of uncertainty lordship we know you are very busy but even then you have spared valuable time and uh, and you have uh, you are here with us to share your juristic words of wisdom with uh, to us to in uh, so that we are enlightened and walk towards the studies in the uh, in the light of rule of law and further the access to justice with with our students and our students are also will benefit accordingly so i am i am very greatly honored as well as i welcome you from the core of my heart to this uh, webinar i express my heartful thanks also for sparing your valuable time i on uh, on behalf of the kwaila school as well as kwai university welcome uh, honorable lady justice madam sabrina mckenna from the supreme court of hawaii who has been very kind to spare her uh, uh, her time which is very precious to be with us and to bless us to uh, uh, to to speak the words of intellect and juristic thoughts among us so i am very much grateful to you madam i uh, madam lordship and i thank you very much on this occasion in fact our uh, lordship uh, justice sudan kumar saham has just said that uh, you are the friend of the india really madam you are the friend of the india that is why you are sharing your intellectual thoughts here today with us i i on behalf of the kwaila school and kwai university kwai university uh, all heartedly welcome professor tracy hester also who has been very kind to spare his uh, time with us to enlighten us with her, with his uh, words of wisdom and words of uh, juristic uh, knowledge and and to share his juristic knowledge with us on this occasion of international webinar on this uh, uh, on a uh, rule uh, uh, rule of law and access to justice in the age of uncertainty further with the uh, uh, with the permission of the chair i would like to speak a few words about this university and law school so this university this ifai uh, university dehradun was established by one great educationist and uh, institution builder mr n j yashashwi who was uh, 
who has in fact built 11 universities as well as uh, uh, many, uh, uh, in which seven, uh, seven are having law schools in India, in the different parts of the country. So, and the day we, the university started, it was started with a, uh, with a, with, with a mission to impart a, a standard education, which is having a proper blend of professional skill and research for the students of all uh, of the Indian origin as well as from abroad. So, uh, so keeping the, that mission, we have been working continuously and particularly in the year 2020, we have been awarded with 44 URI, that is called World, World University for Real Application in Education and, uh, and, and Technology this year. Further, we, India, our law school is also, with your good wishes, is doing wonderfully well. And this year, we have been uh, uh, ranked as the uh, uh, sixth top university of super excellence by CSR ranking, whereas the India Today ranking has put us on this year at, at 26 throughout the India. We are the, one of the best universities in, in Uttarakhand. And, uh, so we, we have, uh, and our university has been uh, recognized as E-lead university, which is capable of imparting the uh, E-education among the students. So on this occasion, uh, I, I take the opportunity to thank and uh, uh, to welcome each and every law professional as well as the law professor from different part of the world and India who have been kind enough to, to be here, to hear the words of intellect and, and thoughts of juristic uh, versions from our law great speakers of the day. So with this, I, have, I, I think I've taken much of, your, uh, much of the time. I don't want to be there in between uh, 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 you and the uh, great speakers, those who are very much stalwarts of the, uh, of, of the occasion. But of course, I, from the core of the heart, will certainly thank before I leave this platform, to our Mr. Justice Swatant Kumar Saha, because Lordship has, uh, has, ex has exceptionally supported us, inspired us, and guided us to make this particular uh, 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 international webinar to be conducted. In fact, the, my words are not enough to express the gratitude for whatever sir has done for us. I'm very much grateful to you. I'm, I'm very much grateful to you, sir. I'm very much thankful to you, sir, for all you have, for whatever you have done for us, sir. With this, I, I, I leave that as for the great dignitaries. Thank you very much. Uh, respected, sir. Thank you very much for your address. Indeed, we are fortunate enough and blessed to be a witness of this international event. And to begin and to process it further, now it's a time for the kind words of our guest. And before that, I humbly request our Academy Coordinator, Mrs. Monica Korola, ma'am, to kindly introduce our Honorable Justice Surya Kansar. Ma'am, over to you. Thank you, Avnish. It's my privilege to introduce to all the participants Justice Surya Kant, Supreme Court of India. Your honor was born on 10th of February, 1962 at Hisar. Your honor graduated from the government postgraduate college Hisar in 1981, earned bachelor's degree in law in 1984 from Maharishi Dayanand University, Rohtak. Your Honor started practicing law at the District Court Hisar in 1984 and shifted to Chandigarh in 1985 to practice in the Punjab and Haryana High Court. Your Honor specialized in constitutional service and civil matters. 
Your Honor represented a number of universities, boards, corporations, banks, and also the High Court itself. Your Honor earned distinction of being appointed as the youngest Advocate General of Haryana on July 7, 2000, and was designated as Senior Advocate in March 2001. Your Honor held the Office of Advocate General Haryana till his elevation as a permanent judge to the Punjab and Haryana High Court on January 9, 2004. Your Honor was nominated as member of the Governing Board of National Legal Services Authority on February 23, 2007 for two consecutive terms till February 22, 2011. Presently, a member of various committees of Ind uh, committees like in the Indian Law Institute, a deemed university under the aegis of the Honorable Supreme Court of India. Your Honor has earned another distinction of standing first class first in his master's degree in law in 2011 from the Directorate of Distance Education, Kurukshetra University. Your Honor has also organized and attended various prestigious national, international conferences, and Your Honor assumed charge of the Office of Chief Justice of High Court of Himachal Pradesh with effect from 5th October 2008. Your Honor was elevated as Judge of the Supreme Court of India on 24th May 2019. Thank you, Your Honor, for being with us and it's a privilege to be in your presence. Over to you, Avnish. Your Honor, if you could take the mic, please. Okay, okay, please. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Mr. Justice Sapindra Kumar, former judge of Supreme Court of India, Honorable Justice Sabrina from the Supreme Court of Hawaii, Professor Tracy Hasler, Hester from the University of Houston, Professor Dr. Mudu Vinay in absentia, the Vice Chancellor of ICFAI University, Dehradun, Professor Yugal Kishore. Dean, Law School of the University, Dr. Avnish Bhatt, the Assistant Professor, Ms. Ekta Ghelawat, Assistant Professor, Mrs. Monica Karola, the Academic Coordinator of the Law School, members of the University faculty, I can see some members of the bar also have joined us. I welcome them as well. And my dear students, thank you very much for inviting me to share my views on the subject of rule of law and access to justice in the age of uncertainty. Starting with Indian perspective, I wish to point out that India has one of the widest and most inclusive constitutions in the world. Since 1950, our Republic has defied numerous apprehensions of failure and in stark contrast to our subcontinental neighbors, which have undergone various political turmoils, violent dethroning and multiple constitutions our democracy has withstood the test of time. However, despite the volume of our constitution and the breadth of its safeguards, there remains significant scope for improvement on many important socio-political indices. We fairly poor when it comes to ensuring a uniform basic standard of living for all our citizens, and there are issues like inequality, poverty, and corruption, 
which need to be addressed more effectively. The dream for a free, just, and equal republic, as envisaged by our constitutional framers, has not been fully translated into reality for many of our fellow citizens. Despite there being a series of fundamental rights guaranteed to every person under our constitution, we have not been able to completely transform our society, nor have we been able to effectively mold the actions of those who matter in governance. This fear that constitutional rights might remain mere parchment barriers is nothing new nor limited only to our nation. In as early as 1780s, while writing the Federalist Papers in support of the new United Nations Constitution, remember James Madison cautioned against the possibility of tyrannical majorities and propounded a solution. He emphasized the need to have coherent, prospective, predictable, and equal laws administered by independent institutions manned by men of courage and integrity. Madison impressed upon that the mere presence of rights would not be enough and that their effectuation ought to be the subject of equal, if not greater, concern. Indeed, research does show that incorporation of rights by themselves means little. Even the most authoritarian countries have numerous rights on paper, what perhaps separates them from just and democratic countries is the ideal, as we call rule of law. Discussing the rule of law, let's explore the interrelated concepts of rule of law and access to justice, which ensure that the rights guaranteed under our constitution can be effectively implemented. Though the rule of law and access to justice are primarily procedural in nature, they are somewhat wrapped around a bundle of fundamental rights and constitutional principles. Therefore, these rights are extremely crucial in holding together our constitutional vision. The term rule of law is a phrase that is often used in a very imprecise manner. In common parlance, it symbolizes the existence of a robust and healthy judicial system. Many philosophers and jurists, beginning from Aristotle in 350 BC, have attempted to define this principle with each adding their own morality and perspective to it. Indeed, the discourse around its definition is so rich that any attempt at summarization over the next few minutes would be a futile exercise. But broadly speaking, rule of law is an ideal of political morality, just like the ideals of democracy or freedom. It's a tool to place checks on authority and to regulate power through public accountability. Rule of law establishes a bond of reciprocity between the ruler and the ruled with the objective of equalizing the asymmetry of power between them. There is also a strong viewpoint that rule of law is not a substantive right by itself, but is rather a tool for the promotion and enforcement of other rights. Regardless of the fact that a huge amount of jurisprudence has been developed and acted upon in the modern era, the concept of rule of law and access to justice is worth traceable back to ancient Indian traditions. I should remind you the rules of dharma that governed ancient Indian society strongly disapproved the animalistic instinct of matasya nyaya that is known the law which follows and allow the big fish to eat smaller ones. They instead emphasized on known ambiguity in law, the importance of fairness and cast a duty on the king to follow certain principles of justice. An illustrative example of rule of law in ancient India, as we were taught while we were students of law, is the story of a king 
whose son had killed a poor and innocent person. While the trial was being conducted before the king, his wife served him some special dishes. The king realized that this was meant to influence his decision-making process. He therefore refused to eat the food, went back to his court, and concluded the trial by holding his son guilty of the murder. This exemplifies how the moral and judicial approach used to enforce the principles of equality before law. Coming to the modern jurisprudence, as you know, A.V. Dicey says that the rule of law requires three things. First, the supremacy of the law. Second, equality before the law. And third, consistency and predictability by way of common law. This is in contrast to an arbitrary, ad hoc, or discretionary system, or in the words of Aristotle, a rule by men. The law ought to be the same for everyone, and no one should have any special protection, liability, or privilege. Dr. Lonfule has very aptly said, and I quote, be a never so high, the law is above you. But then rule of law cannot be ensured without an independent judiciary and access to justice, making both these principles essential part of rule of law itself. Although Dicey's approach is appealing because of its simplicity, but in my opinion, Tom Bingham has modernized the understanding of the rule of law more holistically by adding eight sub-rules which progressively expand the meaning of rule of law. Lord Bingham has very eloquently explained that, one, law should be accessible, clear, and predictable. Two, questions of rights and liabilities ought to be decided by application of the law. Three, the law of the land should apply equally to all, except when objective difference requires differentiation. Four, public officials should exercise their powers in good faith and not exceed them. Five, the law must protect fundamental rights. Six, a method should be provided at reasonable cost to resolve civil disputes. Seven, fair adjudicative procedures must be provided by the state. And seventh, the last one, the state ought to comply with its obligations in international law. The Indian constitution does not expressly recognize or make applicable either access to justice or rule of law, unlike Article 34 of the Constitution of South Africa. But I believe that each of the eight requirements for rule of law, as suggested by Lord Bingham, can be found under our Constitution or can be traced to our precedent-based common law system. Fundamental rights are guaranteed under Part 3 of our Constitution, and any laws inconsistent to it are liable to be struck down under Article 13. Fair adjudicative principles, like the principles of natural justice, have been imported into our legal system through common law jurisprudence. And due process has been constitutionalized through Article 21. Equality in law, as well as of opportunity and employment, and prohibition of discrimination, have been incorporated into Article 14 to Article 17. Certain retrospective laws are prohibited by Article 20 and a unique powerful mechanism for enforcement of fundamental rights has been guaranteed through Article 32 and Article 226. Free legal aid and equal justice are mandated by Article 39A and Article 51 of the Constitution, which imposes upon the state the obligation to comply with international law and maintain international peace and community. Various other doctrines of public trust, accountability, transparency, and certainty are traceable in various articles under the directive principles of state policy. There is thus little doubt that the rule of law is an intrinsic part of the Indian legal system. <clears throat> and indeed, our constitutional courts routinely rely upon its constituent principles while dispensing justice. For example, when dealing with censorship of a film which criticized governmental policy, 
the Supreme Court in S. Rangarajan versus P. Jagjivan Ram held, and I quote, we are amused, yet troubled by the stand taken by the state government with regard to the film which has been received the national award. We want to put the anguished question, what good is the protection of freedom of expression if state does not take care to protect it? If the film is unobjectionable and cannot constitutionally be restricted under Article 19 sub Article 2, freedom of expression cannot be suppressed on account of threat of demonstration and processions or threats of violence. That would tend to amount to negation of the rule of law and a surrender to blackmail and intimidation. It is the duty of the state to protect the freedom of expression since it is a liberty guaranteed against the state. The state cannot plead its inability to handle the hostile audience problem. It is obligatory duty to prevent it and protect the freedom of expression. The principle rather more beautifully was famously invoked by Justice H.R. Khanna in his powerful dissent in ADM Jabalpur versus Shukan Shukla. That's a, one of the historical judgments of the uh, Indian courts. And I, I, I would like to quote what just Justice Khanna said in that judgment. His Lordship said, rule of law is the antithesis of arbitrariness. Rule of law is now the accepted form of all civilized societies. Everywhere it is identified with the people and liberty of the individuals. It seeks to maintain a balance between the opposing notions of individual liberty and public order. In every state, the problem arises of reconciling human rights with the requirement of public interest. Such harmonizing can only be attained by the existence of independent courts which can hold the balance between citizen and the state and compel governments to conform to the law. In a later judgment, in Pancham Chandwar's state of Himachal Pradesh, the Supreme Court struck down the grant of a state's carriage permit granted by the chief minister, noting that despite being the highest political executive in the state government, it would be in contravention of the rule of law and consequently impermissible for him to exercise the statutory functions which had been bestowed on another subordinate authority. It must be mentioned that the rule of law is not merely some empty jurisprudential principle meant for only a particular, particularly well-to-do section of society. Instead, it very palpably increases the level of justice, equality, democracy, transparency, peace, and commerce in society. Numerous studies have noted a positive correlation between socioeconomic indicators like health, income, and employment with improvements in rule of law. Perhaps this can be explained by the impact rule of law has generally on certainty and predictability, which in turn is the bedrock of commerce. Rule of law is an essential building block for good governance and economic growth, for it creates the right conditions for the enforcement of private relationships. This is illustrated by the fact that five of the 11 indicators used by the World Bank in its annual doing business report are related to the strength and functioning of legal institutions. In fact, the fourth sub rule of Lord Bingham, which I read out earlier, which requires officials to transparently act in good faith for the public good in many ways refers to good governance only. Friends, business thrives when it understands the current rules and can predict what changes might occur in the future. In one sense, the necessity for the rule of law in order to achieve economic progress is like the need to have a fair empire in order to play a good game of cricket. A biased referee or a society without independently adjudicated fair laws would fail to bring out the best in its players. 
let's in that context discuss about access to justice also though we have mentioned earlier but access to justice is a very essential component of the rule of law and perhaps the one which we are most lacking today our legal system is facing serious challenges of pendency cost and possibility and even inequity all of which are nothing but core access to justice problems there is broad consensus that access to justice is a desirable virtue which invokes notions of equality and fairness yet there is less clarity over what are its exact ingredients i believe that access to justice should be understood in two ways the first when we emphasize on access and thus concentrate on availability of resources second when we emphasize upon the expression justice which means the final redress accorded by the legal system a country can be said to have access to justice when it can effectively and efficiently remedy the grievances of its populace at the very threshold there must be a recognition of grievances through the incorporation of legal rights then there must be broad awareness among the masses of these redressal avenues and perhaps most importantly there must be a just mechanism of adjudication and legal aid and finally there must be enforced easily within a timely manner this requirement is not just by courts but also by the executive the legislature the law community and the civil society i mean all stakeholders it would thus be myopic to understand access to justice only as a problem of pendency or costs it is a larger issue of inadequate legal remedy deficient legal aid lack of legal awareness and weak enforcement of rights all compounded by formalism and literacy barriers these principles have been reiterated most famously by the supreme court of india in the case of husain ara khatun and have also been incorporated into our constitution by way of article 39a a constitution bench of the supreme court in anita khuswaha's case authoritatively declared that access to justice is an intrinsic and inalienable human right emanating from article 21 in fact the entire edifice of our constitutional justice system centers around article 32 and article 226 which by providing direct access to the highest courts of the land for enforcement of citizens fundamental rights are nothing short of revolutionary access to justice therefore is a core virtue of the indian constitution and cannot be ignored at any cost coming to the third component of the today's discussion namely the uncertainty part arising out of covid 19 friends it would be unfair to not acknowledge that there has been some impact on rule of law in india and across the world because of the corona virus pandemic history shows that these ideals are impacted in times of crisis the second world war witnessed numerous erosions of personal freedom in the name of military necessity like in the infamous kore matsu incident when the supreme court of the united states failed to intervene in a case where japanese american citizens were jailed without trial merely because of their race similarly in india we have first hand witnessed how enforcement of fundamental rights was suspended during the 1975 emergency the present health crisis has necessitated swift action on part of the government and some extreme restrictions on freedom and liberty from mandatory quarantines to travel restrictions shuttering of educational institutions to restaurants interpretation of recreation activities and closing of those activities and even sources of livelihood all these measures adopted in india have been intense both in quantity and quality in order to trace context and quarantine 
suspected positive patients, the state might have expanded its surveillance and interception capabilities also. These increased opportunities for conflicts are further worsened by the inability of courts to function at full capacity due to social distancing requirements. A report from the Global Access to Justice Project indicates that only 8% of the legal system across the world functioned normally during the pandemic. The pandemic is thus simultaneously delaying the resolution of the existing disputes and is also creating new conflicts. Although as citizens, we owe a duty to make sacrifices for the collective benefit of our nation, nonetheless, we must ensure that the exceptional powers invoked by the executive do not continue to operate after the pandemic. We must make a conscious effort to protect the rights of vulnerable groups of poor, marginalized, and the disadvantageous sections of society. In the present paradigm, when traditional courts are somewhat at a standstill due to the coronavirus, internet and technology have come as important allies to help solve this access to justice problem. Fundamentally, technology erases one of the two most important barriers of geography and access, and the internet resolves the problem of convenience and cost. Online virtual court, which was only an experiment till a couple of months ago, has become the new normal as a result of the coronavirus pandemic. In fact, the courts started relying upon technology to aid adjudication well before the present pandemic. For example, various high courts have initiated virtual courts for petty traffic cases. The work which earlier required about a dozen judicial officers is now being handled by only a handful of judges who electronically adjudicate the contested matters. Similarly, the Supreme Court has been translating its judgments into various vernacular languages with the help of artificial intelligence. Many high courts are improving their process of e-filing and computerizing their records for easy access and free availability. Such reforms would lead to a demystification of the justice dispensation mechanism, thereby creating greater transparency and accountability. Today's e-courts have also led to three very clear benefits. One, geographical limitations for lawyers have been erased. It is now commonplace for lawyers residing, say, in Urunachal Pradesh to appear before the Supreme Court through video conferencing. Concomitantly, Indian lawyers are appearing in cross-border arbitrations from within the confines of their homes. Two, e-courts not only help younger members of the bar, but they also drastically reduce fee paid by clients for advocates, travel, filing, and by way of lost earnings. Three, they facilitate much needed competition in the legal industry. Although the coronavirus has led to the adoption of technology out of compulsion, we must continue to use it voluntarily. To deal with the docket explosion facing Indian courts, a mix of physical and virtual hearings could be a good way of administering justice. In the middle of all this, we should ensure not to create a new marginalized class. Although internet penetration has skyrocketed in the past decade, nevertheless, almost half of our population is still awaiting high-speed internet to sustain video conferencing and research work. I would therefore like to conclude by reiterating that we must not be despondent over the fact that we are still talking about rule of law and access to justice even 70 years after India's independence. As a nation, we have collectively taken significant strides over this time. These are ever pervasive and universal issues. What is perhaps more important than resolving them is the constant attempt at doing so for rule of law and access to justice are nothing but aspirational goals and 
achieving them is a perpetual process of incremental improvement our legal system and many others across the globe have adapted to the needs of the covid era although a lot more still need to be done we must remember that justice deals with human with people and their disputes and care must be taken to ensure that in our quest for modernization the justice delivery system is not dehumanized thank you very much thank you thank you sir uh, respected lord uh, thank you very much uh, for your emotional and kind words and the technical thought process and the dynamics of law which you has presented in posted in front of us and definitely it will in, in our intellectual thought processes for the taking it further i would now request Uh, our faculty convener miss ekta gelao to take it forward and to introduce our second speaker honorable ladyship justice sabrina ma'am ekta ma'am over to you thank you so much sir good morning everyone uh, now i would like to start with the introduction of justice sabrina justice sabrina is an american judge from the us state of hawaii since march 3 2011 she has served as a justice of supreme court of hawaii justice sabrina graduated from the university of hawaii at manoa and its william s richardson school of law she practiced civil litigation and business law in honolulu based uh, served as a journal counsel to a japan based conglomerate taught business law at the uhm college of business and then was an assistant professor at the william s richardson school of law in 1993 she was appointed as a limited jurisdiction court judge and in 1995 as a general jurisdiction court judge also serving as a chief family court judge in 2011 she was appointed one of the five justices of hawaii supreme court she is a judicial advisory board member of george mason university law and economic center and also teaches for the national judicial college she has been honored by the jinder global law school as an eminent jurist and honorary adjunct professor of law by the association of corporate counsel foundation as a global women in law and leadership honorary by the national association pacific bar association with the daniel k trail brazier award and by the hawaii friends for the civil rights with the dr martin luther luther king friends award and by the university of hawaii as the distinguished alumni thank you ma'am it's our honor to have you with us over to you ma'am namaste and aloha from hawaii um honorable justice swantantar kumar justice kant Professor Hester, Honorable Dean, and professors, dignitaries, uh, everyone in the audience, it's truly an honor to be able to speak to you. I'd like to thank Justice Kumar, um, former Justice of the India Supreme Court, uh, who headed the National Green Tribunal with such courage and foresight for inviting me to join this esteemed panel. Um, you know, I. I'm thank you Justice Kumar for calling me a friend of India. I have had the honor of visiting India several times. Although I have not had the honor of visiting Iqfai University Dehradun and your law school, I had I was privileged to visit Dehradun and Mussoorie in March of 2019 to visit Rajaji National Park and I hiked up the Jabar Kat Net Nature Reserve. to see the majesty of the himalayas in the distance so i would like to provide a little bit more uh context of my background um as indicated i am one of five justices of the supreme court of the state of hawaii one of, which is one of the 50 states of the united states of america hawaii is an island state in the middle of the north pacific ocean it's the most remote populated landmass in the world um and it has six major populated islands 
Hawaii's population is only 1.4 million as compared to almost 1.4 billion in India. But Hawaii and India do have some things in common. We are also a multicultural, multi-religious society. We are unique among the 50 states as we are the only state with a majority Asian population. I believe visitors from India feel quite comfortable when they visit Hawaii. And let me tell you that Asian Americans in Hawaii and across the United States are very proud that an Indian American has been elected vice president. Like India, the native people of Hawaii also experienced colonial oppression. In Hawaii's case, it was by the United States. But Hawaii has also had, has had a strong British influence. And if you were to Google to look at the flag of Hawaii, you would see that the British Union Jack is part of the flag of the state of Hawaii. The constitution of the state of Hawaii is even younger than the India constitution, as our constitution was promulgated in 1959, when Hawaii became a state. And Hawaii, like the rest of the United States, except for Louisiana, is also a common law jurisdiction. And interestingly, section 1-1 of the Hawaii Revised Statute says, the common law of England, as ascertained by English and American decisions, is declared to be the common law of the state of Hawaii in all cases, except as otherwise expressly provided by Constitution of the United States or the laws of the state, etc. So we do have a also have a strong British uh, connection. Um, but let me tell you that I am not originally from Hawaii. I was born and raised in Japan with one year in the Philippines as the only child of, a, of an American professor and a Japanese mother. Uh, my mother was later naturalized as a US citizen. I grew up in a bilingual, bicultural and multi-religious background. I went to Christian churches, Buddhist temples and Shinto shrines. And I attended uh, American education, US, United States Department of Defense schools, graduated from high school, in the, uh, from a US school in Tokyo, Japan. And then I came to the University of Hawaii at Manoa, which I attended on a women's basketball scholarship. And uh, in terms of, um, uh, you've heard about my background, my professional background, and uh, we are appointed to uh, the Hawaii Supreme Court for 10 year terms. I was appointed in early 2011, and I have just been retained to serve until my mandatory retirement age of 70, which is older than uh, the India mandatory retirement. The Hawaii Supreme Court is the final arbiter of all issues of Hawaii state law, including we have the five justices have the privilege of construing uh, our unique Hawaii state constitution, that's a little bit different. Uh, we, each state has its own constitution. And the Hawaii Supreme Court uh, contains explicit provisions protecting a person's right to privacy, to a clean and healthful environment. And we even have the right of private and public employees to unionize and collectively bargain. The Hawaii Constitution also protects, protects traditional and customary practices of our indigenous population. Our court takes very seriously our prerogative uh, under United States federalism to construe our Constitution to provide greater civil rights and environmental protection than provided under federal law or by other states. Now, unfortunately, we have, being that we are so isolated and have such little land, we have a very, very high cost of living. Um, we have the highest median house prices um, within the United States as a state. There are more expensive cities, but as a state, we have the highest house costs. And therefore, we also have 
uh, the highest per capita homeless population uh, of about seven to 10,000 people of our 1.4 million living on the streets in tents or under tarps. So having provided this background, I'd like to talk a little bit more now about the topic of the rule of law and access to justice in the age of uncertainty. I'd like to, um, I wanna talk about the rule of law, what it means and access to justice, what appears to be some, some of the challenges, but also how uncertainty can sometimes create positive change. And I'd like to leave with you some thoughts as to the future. So the rule of law, as Justice Kant has said, according to the World Justice Project, the rule of law is a framework of laws and institution that embodies four universal principles. First is accountability, which means the government as well as private actors are accountable under the law. Second, the laws must be just. The laws must be clear publicized, stable, and just, and applied evenly. They must protect fundamental rights, including the security of persons, contract and property rights, and certain core human rights. Third, open government. The processes by which the laws are enacted, administered, and enforced must be accessible, fair, and efficient. And fourth, accessible and impartial dispute res resolution. Justice must be delivered timely by competent, ethical, and independent representatives and neutrals who are accessible, have adequate resources, and reflect the makeup of the communities they serve. And in this regard, I am proud to say that the state of Hawaii judiciary is the most diverse judiciary in the United States, uh, much more diverse than the federal judiciary and much more diverse than other state court judiciaries. We have uh, about 45% women um, and we have our racial makeup, our uh, ethnic background reflects our community. So in terms of the rule of law, our four universal principles are further developed and into, divided into eight factors, which are constraints on government powers, absence of corruption, open government, fundamental rights, order and security, regulatory enforcement, civil justice, and criminal justice. And these eight factors are further disaggregated by the World Justice Project into 44 sub factors. Now, I recommend that you uh, Google the World Justice Project and look up the rule of law index. They do this every year. They, uh, the World Justice Project scores and ranks uh, the rule of law of 168 nations every year. Uh, they do this um, through uh, surveys of 130,000 surveys, household surveys, and they also survey legal practitioners and experts throughout the world. And um, interestingly, in 2020, uh, they ranked 168 countries, and the top 10 are Denmark, Norway, Finland, Sweden, Netherlands, Germany, New Zealand, Austria, Canada, and Estonia. And the United States came in 21st and India came in 69th. And if you look at the country breakdowns, you will see the areas in which the United States and India uh, are seen to be need to improve and why the United States is only 21 in the world. Um, very, very interestingly, uh, one of the criteria under constraints on government powers is the lawful transition of power. India is actually ranked higher than the United States in this. India is ranked 73 out of 100. 
the United States, as of when this was published, was ranked number 70. Talk about lawful transition of power. I'm curious to see how much that number in the United States is going to go down next year after what we are seeing in the United States this year. In terms of access to justice, it, it, as Justice Kant has said, it is an aspect of the rule of law and it addresses how ordinary people around the world navigate their everyday legal problems, including legal disputes. Now, I'm very heartened to learn that India recognizes access to justice as a constitutional right. I am not aware of any state in the United States or the federal uh, um, courts recognizing ac access to justice itself as a constitutional right, although aspects of what forms access to justice is of course recognized. Now access to justice is usually refers to the civil justice arena, but I'd also like to talk about the criminal um, uh, arena because I think it is also an aspect of access to justice. I believe in India, like the United States, uh, there is a recognition of a constitutional right to counsel in criminal cases. Um, but the right of counsel only applies in criminal cases in the United States, and there's no right to counsel in civil cases. Um, so um, in terms of the age of uncertainty, uh, what has actually happened in Hawaii, as I believe in India and other parts, the governor has, uh, we have some emergency power laws that are written into our statutes. Uh, the governor has imposed uh, quarantine. Early on, there were complete travel restrictions. We did not let anyone fly into Hawaii. Actually, we couldn't do that because there is a constitutional right to travel under the United States federal constitution, but we did impose 14 day quarantines. And, um, but, and many businesses were closed. Uh, many um, uh, government offices were closed initially, but then we started opening up and going online. Um, in terms of um, the criminal area, in terms of this age of uncertainty, of course, the closure of courts initially was devastating. Um, and I really wanna talk about the issue of prisoners and pretrial detainees and the issue of cash bail, which means that people that could not afford to post bail were being held and continue to be held in custody without trial. Um, and, and it became a huge issue because I'm not sure how much of an issue it is in India, but we had a problem with many prisoners in the United States catching COVID prisoners dying. And so in an effort to address that, uh, some state Supreme Courts, including ours, ordered the release of certain categories of prisoners, presumptive release with each, with judges to review um, whether these people could be released. But based on, um, in terms of pretrial detainees that were not being held on, um, on serious criminal offenses uh, of, that involved violence or assault or sexual assault, we um, ordered that judges, the trial judges reviewed to see whether these prisoners could be released pending trial. Um, and you should be aware that in Hawaii, we have not gone there yet, but there are states within the United States that have eliminated cash bail. It's either bail or no bail. And it's no bail if you are a danger to society or considered a flight risk, but otherwise you are released perhaps with conditions, perhaps home confinement um, or with ankle bracelets, electronic monitoring. But um, that has been an issue during this um, pandemic. In terms of the civil side, um, we have a huge problem with access to justice uh, because there is no constitutional right to counsel. Um, there have been many studies that show that there are many people that are not adequately getting their civil justice needs addressed. 
Um, and that is a whole problem in Hawaii also. Our studies show that also. Uh, our court did create an access to justice commission and we have other committees in an attempt to address access to justice issues from before the uh, pandemic. Um, we have done a pretty good job in terms of language access. We provide language access to all uh, civil matters in court and our Hawaii law requires language access to government services in all matters. Um, we also provide uh, under, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, of course, there's always sign language interpreters available for everyone. Um, but, and before the pandemic, we had started some other access to justice initiatives. We have self-help centers in all of our courts where attorneys provide legal uh, assistance and advice and help uh, self-represented litigants prepare court forms, uh, review their documents to make sure they're complete, uh, completed properly. We started uh, uh, providing access to lawyers within our law library. And, um, you know, what has happened, and we ha started a program where we allow, we answer questions, lawyers volunteer to answer questions online. Um, and in, we started e-filing, the federal courts in the United States have been e-filing for many, many years. The state of Hawaii started in 2010. Uh, we have e-filing of all court records since 2010, except we still have to incorporate our family court, which is going to happen in two years. And then all of our filings will be e-filing. But let me tell you that the e-filing, having e-filing in place has really, really helped uh, because um, the documents are still accessible. So what happened uh, after the pandemic started really in the United States, it was about March when um, travel restrictions started. Uh, you know, we did not use Zoom or uh, remote uh, before. Um, Although I will tell you that after 9-11, I was the first trial judge in the state of Hawaii. In, nine, uh, in October of 2001, um, after 9-11, uh, we had problem people who did not want to fly. Uh, we had a medical malpractice case and the plaintiff's expert medical doctor would not fly to Hawaii. So we took his testimony via, um, via video teleconference. So that was the first trial in Hawaii, civil trial to use a video teleconferencing. Uh, but, you know, we did not routinely use video teleconferencing or Zoom or remote. But when we realized that the pandemic closure was going to continue, from May, our Hawaii Supreme Court started doing all of our oral arguments uh, via Zoom, uh, via remote. And uh, so did our appellate court. Um, and this is something that I believe is going to continue after the pandemic, uh, because uh, as I said, we have other islands and now we are, we've discovered it's much better to allow the attorneys to not have to fly in to Honolulu to do the uh, arguments um, and, 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 uh, so th this is this is something that we know will continue. Uh, our lower courts have also started zo doing Zoom hearings. Uh, have been doing it for months now. Um, you know, it's, I'm sure it's just like India. It's just like this this uh, webinar. Uh, the judges, there's like uh, several hundred people in Zoom, uh, and they just call it like traffic cases, the minor criminal cases. We've been doing it via Zoom. Um, and, uh, but what about the people that don't have reliable internet or don't have access to internet? We are starting from next week, we are uh, starting um, our law library. Uh, people can come into our law library to do, to do Zoom hearings. And um, we're going to, there's, I, there's a proposal to create additional uh, remote hearing spaces. And this is something that I think might continue. It's ironic that our traffic courts have found that uh, after the pandemic with Zoom, more people are showing up for traffic court proceedings than 
than uh, before the pandemic when people didn't show up. Not as many people showed up. So, um, so you know, we are starting to use the law libraries and the public libraries more. We're using our public libraries for our, uh, we have a homeless court where a judge will go out and assist. Uh, we Unfortunately, United States and Hawaii criminalizes homelessness. And, um, you know, they have laws that say you cannot be on a sidewalk and people are getting citations and criminally cited. Um, and of course, if you are living in poverty, you can't afford the fines. You might not be able to pay for your fines. You may not be able to um, buy car insurance if you are able to get a car and you might end up with criminal sanctions. So we have homeless courts that are now going out to our public libraries to address uh, these cases and to allow the homeless people to clear their records so that they can get back into the workforce. Um, we, our courts are opening up slowly but surely. As you know, in the United States, we have jury trials. So for, for criminal cases, our constitution requires, our state constitution requires that these be in person. So we were not able to do jury trials for a long time, but we have started uh, we have uh, started criminal jury trials in our courtrooms with appropriate spacing. Everyone in Hawaii must wear masks. Um, and we have plexiglass that are protecting the witnesses and the judges. Um, the jurors are spread at least two meters apart. So we have, in, we, have plant, we have social distancing and our courtrooms are opening back up. Um, so... So there are steps that we are taking, but the problem in terms of access to justice, in my view, is that unless we have civil, uh, the right to attorneys in civil cases, which in the United States is called civil Gideon, which is based on the uh, case of Supreme Court case of Gideon versus Wainwright, 1963, which the United States Supreme Court said that the Sixth Amendment right to counsel applies to state court criminal proceedings. Um, and we don't have that in civil cases. Some countries do have the right to counsel in civil cases. Uh, but unless we do that, I, I don't think that we are actually going to have true access to justice. And there are, you know, I think there are arguments that can be made based on um, international treaties that um, International Declaration of Human Rights. Um, there are other treaties that even the United States are signatory to that you could argue, I believe, that uh, there should be a recognition of a right to counsel in civil cases. But in the interim, we are doing what we can through uh, using our law libraries, through using our um, Zoom, remote hearings, uh, our mediators are using Zoom. Um, to do uh, remote mediations. Uh, there are remote arbitrations taking place. The only thing is the criminal cases, we have to have our jury trials in person. And there are states within the United States, I believe Texas is a leader that they have actually had some civil jury trials uh, through Zoom. So um, to summarize, this age of uncertainty has displayed issues regarding rule of law and access to justice. Um, and some adjustments have been made that I believe are going to actually stay with us even after the pandemic. You know, on a really kind of serious note, I, I just wanna say that the rule of law and access to justice are trademarks of democracies. And, but in every region of the world, democracy itself is under attack by populist leaders and groups that reject pluralism and demand unchecked power to advance the particular interests of their supporters, usually at the expense of minorities and other perceived foes. So therefore, I'd like to encourage all members of the audience, you, the current and future leaders of India, to do what you can to ensure the rule of law, access to justice, 
and a thriving, healthy democracy. And I send you much positive energy from Hawaii, which we call aloha. Namaste. Thank you. Uh, respected ladyship, Honorable Justice Sabrina, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much for enlightening all of us on the perspective that how U.S. is addressing and doing the things during the time of COVID and pandemic times. And also how the U.S. is ensuring the rule of law and access to justice during this time of uncertainty. And also you have thrown the light on various facets of law that how you the U.S. is doing in U.S. manner. So thank you very much again, ma'am. Now, moving further for our third speaker for his address. So before requesting our third speaker, Professor Tracy Hester, I would like to introduce respected sir. Respected Tracy Hester is an associate instructional professor at the University of Austin Law Center, where he directs environmental activities and the speaker series for the environment, energy and natural resource center. Prior to joining University of Houston, Professor Hester was a partner at Bracewell LLP for 16 years and headed it Houston Environmental Group. Professor Tracy Hester has also practiced in environmental law for over 30 years and has previously served as the chair of the American Bar Association, SWR, CEER, Environmental Enforcement and Criminal Committee. Also, sir, was the chair of the Houston Bar Association's environmental section and has also headed several other positions. Respected sir, we again warmly welcome to you. And now over to you, sir, for your address. Thank you so much for such a generous introduction, Dr. Bhatt. It, it's a great honor to join this uh, webinar and to join such a distinguished list of speakers. So I wanted to extend my appreciation, uh, say namaste for everyone, uh, to say that it's a great pleasure to be with uh, Justice Kant, uh, Justice McKenna, of course, Justice uh, Kumar, and to uh, join the dialogue, which has really been illuminating for me. Of course, the challenge is that being the last speaker, I have to now add things that haven't already been said but hopefully we can say some interesting things tonight. So uh, a little bit of additional context. Uh, your introduction did capture that uh, my area of expertise and specialty is environmental law. Environmental law in the United States comprises many different aspects of practice. So that would involve civil and criminal enforcement, as well as regulatory compliance issues and governmental processes and administrative law. So I'll be talking tonight about some of the key challenges that have arisen in our time of uncertainty, primarily due to COVID in the United States. I'll be talking about particularly how it's impacting uh, the defense and litigation over particular individual rights under our constitution, as well as some issues related to how laws have been suspended in certain contexts and how certain types of judicial processes in Texas are being uh, carried forward, which will hopefully offer an interesting contrast to Justice McKinnis' description of activities in Hawaii. Uh, I also can't resist adding the one most important fact that Justice McKenna didn't say about Hawaii is it's the one state in the United States that everyone else wants to move to. It's really the gem of the United States. So uh, with that in mind, uh, let me offer the backdrop that I think we probably all share uh, in terms of how COVID is proceeding. And in the United States, uh, we are still very much caught between hope and danger. Uh, as everyone knows, our Food and Drug Administration approved today vaccines to be deployed starting next week that hopefully will provide protection against the COVID virus. At the same time, we are still in the midst of a surge of cases, some driven in part by a recent holiday in the United States that led many of us to visit family and travel in conditions that made risk of transmission higher. So we've had already 16 million cases in the United States out of a population of 330 million. 
Of those, we've had nearly 300,000 deaths. We'll likely pass that number in the next couple of days. And our rate of deaths per day has risen to the point where we are nearly to 3,000 deaths every day. That means that we are still very much grappling with how to navigate a time of uncertainty when we are looking at a rollout of vaccine literally in the space of days, but full deployment of that vaccine will likely require several months. Our projections are we will not have sufficient inoculation of our population in the United States until most likely April or May uh, before we start seeing general return to normal life activities here. So against that backdrop, I wanted to look at a couple of core flashpoints, core issues that illustrate how our judiciary and our civil justice system is responding to the challenge and what sorts of insights we're seeing that might be shared with yours as well. So for the most high profile disputes at this point, the ones that have gotten the most constitutional legal attention have focused on the interplay between the power of the state to take actions to reduce the risk of transmission of pandemic disease when balanced against our constitutional guarantee to the free exercise of religion. Uh, in our constitution, it is the first amendment to our Bill of Rights. It's considered to be one of our most fundamental and foundational rights exercised by our public. When viewed in the context of a pandemic, however, there is a long history in the United States of a strong deference by the judicial branch to the executive branch on decisions made to protect public health. Particular one foundational decision from the US Supreme Court issued in 1905, Jacobson versus Massachusetts, indicated that the judicial branch needed to let the executive branch have a large leeway in making decisions necessary to protect human health and the environment, including allegations that the executive had overstepped in certain limited cases, individual rights when public health is at stake. That same mindset was very much in play at the start of the pandemic in the United States. Our pandemic, as Justice McKenna pointed out, really started taking root in mid-March, right about when our universities were on spring breaks. Uh, we started seeing travel restrictions, businesses shut down, and those restrictions, which were largely issued on a state-by-state -state basis, not by one national mandate from our federal government, tended to restrict any type of public assembly areas. So restaurant dining, uh, meetings, concerts, public events, but one of those groups were religious institutions of all sorts. Uh, churches were a target for many of the restrictions for assembly issued during that time frame. Of course, that immediately drew a litigation challenge in the United States. And when the Supreme Court first addressed this, uh, it did so in a decision back in May, which was the South Bay Pentecostal Church decision, where a, uh, a, a split court, but nonetheless a majority of the court, held that the Jacobson v. Massachusetts, that principle I told you about from 1905, still applied. That there was still deference that needed to be granted by the judicial branch to decisions made by the executive branch to protect public health, including at a state executive branch level. Uh, it was uh, predominantly shaped by a concurring decision, uh, opinion written by our Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts. Now, with that in mind, that framework guided decisions made by our states all across the United States on how to respond to the pandemic as it continued through the summer. And in general, the executives of our various state governments had a relatively free hand in trying to restrict how often churches could meet, whether they could meet, and when they did meet, what sort of social distancing obligations they had to satisfy. Well, as the pandemic progressed, as it looked as if this was not an immediate emergency concern requiring a short-term suspension of individual rights, and it looked like we were looking at a period exceeding a year, that tension grew. At the same time, as I suspect it's received some attention uh, in India 
uh, certainly got an enormous amount of attention in the United States. Uh, we had one of our justices, uh, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, pass away. Uh, that led to an immense political battle, but the end result is that we have a new justice sitting on the Supreme Court, uh, Justice uh, Amy, Barrett, uh, Amy Coney Barrett. Uh, she is viewed as more conservative. That changed the chemistry of the court. So we have now had a retesting of the same tension I described, and the court has given a different answer. Uh, in a decision that was just issued last month, uh, the Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn versus Cuomo out of our state of New York, the court reached a different conclusion. Again, the court was split, but this time Justice, Chief Justice Roberts was in the, the losing side of the, of the opinion. And the new majority of conservative justices ruled that it was impermissible for New York to restrict religious meetings uh, because it, they uh, had failed to demonstrate an overriding need to treat religious exercises in such a restrictive manner, especially when viewed in comparison with other activities that the state was allowing to continue, including certain types of shopping activities. So uh, as a result, we are seeing an evolution in real time driven by the pandemic on how our US Supreme Court is thinking about religious liberties guaranteed by our US constitution in a time of uncertainty. We are already seeing additional decisions pushing the boundaries of that, including a decision that just came out last week reaching a similar outcome on restrictions on religious uh, activities in our state of California. Uh, this trend will likely continue and then likely we'll see precedents set now that will play an important role in other types of disputes in the future. So that's the first basket, the first group of issues I wanted to highlight for you that we're wrestling with the United States. The second is besides fighting over individual rights guaranteed by our constitution and the courts, how the pandemic is affecting the actual administration of laws outside of the court system. And here we have rules provided under federal statutes that allow the suspension of certain types of obligations under other laws. Uh, one National Emergencies Act, another one called the Stafford Act, which give the president and by delegation our state governors the power to essentially decree that an emergency exists and because of that emergency, certain legal obligations are suspended. Well, obviously the rise of COVID was viewed as a, a disaster and led to suspension of many different statutory obligations that were viewed as impacting public health. So looking at it through the prism of my specialty at environmental law, for example, our Environmental Protection Agency decided in March to suspend the enforcement of a series of different environmental laws that required facilities to, to essentially determine what their emission levels were and report violations of those permitted emissions to the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, that essentially led to allegations that the agency had effectively suspended environmental protection because of COVID. Now, the justification the agency offered was that a lot of these facilities simply couldn't satisfy the needs of the law because the people they need to do it were not reporting or wouldn't show up or they were putting themselves at grave risk by doing it. So essentially, the policy was designed to tell facilities that they had to do the best they could, but that the agency would not enforce except on a very case-by-case -case basis. Immediately, that led to a firestorm of litigation. Nine different states sued, multiple environmental organizations sued, and that battle played out in the court, and it's still playing out in the courts. EPA has withdrawn that waiver as of May 31st, but other state agencies are still waiving environmental requirements because of the pandemic. Uh, the Railroad Commission in the state of Texas, for example, which for a long mysterious history is the agency in our state that regulates oil and gas operations. Why it's the Railroad Commission is difficult to explain, but nonetheless, they are 
they tried to suspend environmental obligations and were told by a court just this week that that was a violation of law. So we are still determining to what extent this, the executive branch in a time of uncertainty with a pandemic can essentially say, we will not enforce the law because the risk of enforcing the law is greater than the risk that the law is designed to forestall. That is likely to continue until the pandemic is fully abated. And we're not likely to see that for at least another six months. Now, so with that in mind, uh, the third and final area I was able to talk with you about, I've talked about how rights are being tested in the courts during a pandemic, I've talked about how laws and rules are being suspended outside of the courts during a pandemic. Now I'd like to talk about the courts themselves. And you know, just as Justice McKenna outlined you know, from her background, the state of Hawaii, uh, I'm coming and speaking to you from the state of Texas which is the second largest state in the United States. It's a combination of very industrial operations in certain parts with a lot of oil and gas production, along with vast open rural areas that are uh, predominantly ranching and you know, fairly low industrial activities. Uh, as a result, the judiciary has to juggle between dealing with a very large terrain with very few people at the same time, they're dealing with very densely populated urban areas with a lot of cases in the docket. So as a result, uh, as Justice McKenna pointed out, uh, we are innovating, we're experimenting. Now, the most important thing is our Supreme Court, the Texas Supreme Court has said no trials until March of next year. Now that is a, directed towards criminal trials and it's directed towards in-person trials. That does not forestall the possibility of doing trials by video. And we are seeing efforts certainly to do hearings by video. We are seeing some experimental trials being done by video, which are being viewed as success. Uh, but it's also very clear that attempts to try and have in-person courtroom trials with COVID protections and social distancing uh, have been very mixed results. Uh, we had one trial in our eastern portion of our state where seven people in the trial were diagnosed as being positive for COVID by the time the trial was halfway over. So they had to cancel the proceeding. So there's a great deal of caution at this point. I think you're gonna see greater emphasis on building the infrastructure to do things remotely. I think Justice McKenna was exactly right that this is only the beginning because some of the advantages of doing it this way, particularly when you're dealing with parties scattered over a large state, make a lot of sense. And it seems to work, but it only works in certain things. And as part of my story as to how things are going in Texas with the judiciary and COVID, uh, criminal trials are different. And in particular, we have one example of what has turned out to be the longest felony criminal trial in Texas that has been directly impacted by COVID. Uh, bear with me as I tell a little bit of a story. This is a trial that deals with an explosion and a fire at a chemical plant near Houston. The plant was called Arkema Chemical Corporation, and it stored very reactive chemicals that essentially exploded and burned fiercely if you didn't refrigerate them below a certain temperature. Well, three years ago, we had a hurricane by the name of Hurricane Harvey that dropped nearly a meter and a half of rain on top of Houston over the space of six days. Uh, there was so much accumulated water on the surface of the earth in, Texas, in the region of Houston, uh, the, the city where I'm speaking to you from, that they actually measured the crust of the earth deforming under the weight of the water because it was so much of it piled up on it. That backup of water caused the ARCBA chemical facilities generators to fail it caused the refrigerators to short. They tried everything they could to move the chemicals to a safer location, but couldn't. And as a result, exploded and burned for days. The fumes from that explosion drifted over outside the facility and allegedly caused multiple folks, people in the surrounding neighborhood and police officers to report to the hospital for injuries to their breathing. That led our prosecutor in Houston to bring criminal charges against the company. It was the first very high profile, extremely 
uh, important legal trial that started in February. And I think you can guess where this is now going. We were halfway through the trial. I was monitoring the trial and offering, you know, just because I was curious about the legal issues involved when uh, COVID suspended all judicial activity. They tried to reschedule it at least once a month for the next several months and couldn't do it. We eventually didn't resume trial until six months later in September. That trial had to be moved out of the courthouse and was moved to a stadium in South Houston where the jury was sitting in a large convention hall, every member in a chair spaced by 10, uh, about three meters away from each other. Uh, the entire trial team was scattered around the similar distances around the room. It was the oddest trial I'd ever seen. Uh, they were able to broadcast the trial by video so the public could watch it, but they could only watch it remotely for the same reason the COVID protection. And as a result, if you wanted to watch the trial, you had to travel to a courthouse several miles away to watch a television monitor. But it seemed to work. The trial ultimately led to a dismissal of the charges for lack of evidence, but more importantly, it set a template. It showed that it, you know, despite great odds, uh, it was possible to have a trial in these kinds of circumstances. My guess is that we're going to look to these kinds of trials, and it's not just Texas, other states obviously throughout the United States have had to wrestle with the same issue of dealing with criminal trials that were in process when the COVID epidemic hit. And take what lessons we can learn from them about how you can still go on with a trial, even in a situation where you have to maintain protections, masks, and social distancing. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, that is probably going to come back into play fairly soon at some point because there are several other non criminal trials suspended that are going to figure out what they want to do. So last and final point, I kind of talked about three big issues. There's one sort of postscript that I can't resist mentioning. Uh, and that is, well, I mentioned the vaccines that are being rolled out in the United States. Those are actually uh, plan to be distributed starting on, if not tomorrow, certainly by Monday. But there's only a limited number. And that number is being allocated on a state-by-state -state basis according to criteria established by each state. Right now, most states are going to be inoculating health workers and extremely vulnerable populations, the very old uh, people who are in institutions. There has been no information that I've heard about how the judiciary is going to be viewed as a critical institution that merits early inoculation. Now, it may be a moot issue, it may not be relevant because frankly, a lot of our particular federal judges are in categories of our population that are at risk <laughs> because they, they tend to be above a certain age or they might have certain other uh, conditions that make them at higher risk. So they may get inoculated anyway. But it's uh, an important issue because the best and quickest way to get our judiciary back on the, in processing in a way that we're used to, that we're sort of familiar to us, is to treat them like our frontline workers, like our police, like our healthcare workers, and get them inoculated as quickly as possible. Uh, I, and I'm talking about the judiciary and the judicial uh, staff. I'm not sure about the attorneys. That may have to be done on a slightly different basis, but it's something I haven't seen people discuss yet overtly. Uh, so with that, I did want to finish my mar remarks with an offer. Uh, I actually plan to come and speak to you on a different topic tonight. Uh, it was because uh, I was very interested in a particular issue dealing with how the courts are dealing with climate change, particularly tort liability, and how people are to be suing in courts in one nation and enforcing those judgments in a different nation. So. Uh, given the tenor of our remarks earlier, I've decided to talk about these other issues instead, but if anyone's interested in those issues, I have a very detailed PowerPoint, which I'm glad to share with you to have the references and resources, just let me know. With that, thank you again for an opportunity to speak with you. Uh, respected sir, uh, thank you very much uh, for your address and thank you very much for throwing the light on the present contextual issues and nailing on to the various facets during the pandemic situation. So thank you very much, sir, for that. And already we are in short of time, but still, if our speakers permit, then 
can we have a few questions from the audience and at the same time we are having few questions with us already so it's a humble request if uh, you permit me then i will proceed for the question answer session only if you permit honorable justice surakant sir and honorable ladyship uh, sub justice sabrina ma'am and professor tracy ester if you permit then we will proceed all right we can proceed uh, but of course we we, shall, we have to keep in mind the time constraint so that's all sir. all right uh, so uh, we i am having few questions with me from the uh, audiences and first question is referring to honorable justice surakant sir so the question for you so the question is how far is the technological development going to affect the judicial process is it worthwhile to expect that in coming future a person will be able to file and attend cases without physically coming to court yes surely you see in my speech also i have pointed out that uh, with the establishment of uh, e courts and uh, the virtual courts and uh, process of e filing which has been started uh, not only in the high courts but in supreme court as well and uh, the courts being held through video conferencing what you are saying is uh, absolutely it's 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 not that it will be possible in future right now it's a ground reality that the process has already started the only thing is that it needs to be popularized and it it it, it has to be introduced at a larger scale uh, uh, and as of course i said that there are certain matters uh, where the conventional mode of hearing is required where you need to have the physical hearings but a combination of both is eventually an ideal situation and uh, uh, for the betterment and for the early disposal of the matters it's 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 a need of the hour oh okay thank you honorable justice thank you very much now another question is for <clears throat> honorable ladyship sabrina ma'am the question from a uh, audience is that uh, they want to seek your uh, guidance on the concept that rule of law and rule by law Uh, honorable ladyship you need to unmute yourself lady uh, madam unmute yes so sorry that is a very interesting um, concept i know it's been uh, it's it is uh, discussed sometimes um rule rule of law would be ruling based on certain principles of law rule by law would be um uh i've heard it being used as a uh it's rule ruling via laws that are um uh being laid down by the supreme law making authorities of uh of that that uh jurisdiction but candidly i haven't really thought it through so i'm going to toss it out to anyone else that wants to answer that perhaps uh professor hester do you have a sense of that i was actually hoping you'd tell me <laughs> <laughs> thank you uh thank you your ladyship uh now th there is one more question for uh, professor tracy hester to you sir how you see that whether there is an environmental jurisprudential paradigm shift during the pandemic situation how you see on that hmm interesting question uh i haven't seen a paradigm shift in the sense of that people are rethinking in a fundamental way the operation of environmental law it's been more couched as a sense of suspension that there's a moment in time where because of risks and unusual circumstance certain aspects of environmental law need to be set aside and then some others not that there are some critical ones that should be preserved having said that because of the pandemic we are seeing 
certain types of decisions being made about resources that could have longer term effects. It's not a jurisprudential issue as much as which environmental values take priority. So for example, you would see much more attention being paid to environmental health concerns related to the potential exposure of populations to chemicals that might increase their risk for the disease. Uh, one of the issues I'm seeing a great deal of debate about right now is whether or not exposure to certain types of fluorinated pollutants actually reduces the effectiveness of the vaccine that's now being uh, prepared to be administered next week. And as a result, a lot of attention being paid to that being the environmental legal issue needs to be resolved. But as a result, other issues such as uh, degrees of protection are scored to certain types of endangered species seem to have been pushed to the back of the, to the list. I don't think that's a permanent change, but it's gonna take time to work that through. Uh, it also is going to complicate some of the attempts to change the uh, jurisprudential paradigm with our new administration starting in January, where there's anticipated a strong move to enhance environmental justice and climate change priorities. If we're still wrestling with COVID and we're still wrestling with suspension of environmental resources, we're gonna have to figure out how we can do both of those at the same time. And, and that's gonna make it harder to do it either at the same time. Uh, respected sir, thank you very much. And due to the paucity of time, uh, I'm restricting myself. And though I'm bundled with the questions, there are a lot of questions come up for you. And then we are restricting ourselves for the question answer session for here. Now I humbly request our respected Dean sir uh, for the vote of thanks, please. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Avinish Bansa. So now, it is my proud and present duty to propose a vote of thanks to the jurist speakers of the day. At the outset, I express my greatest gratitude to Honorable Law Lordship, Mr. Justice Shurkan sir, for sharing his valuable time for sparing his valuable time and enlightening us with juristic thoughts and words of wisdom on the topic of rule of law and access to justice in the age of uncertainty. Sir has very nicely elaborated upon the concept of rule, rule of law and traced the history and meaning of the rule of law there during different periods of the, uh, of the ages. And then Sir has very, very nicely has uh, talked about the rule of law applicable during the uh, uh, period of uncertainty which we are facing all uh, these days. Lordship, uh, your uh, inspiring words and advice will always inspire my students and academicians present in the webinar. So on behalf of the every one of them, I wholeheartedly with folded hand Thank you very much for spending your valuable time and giving this opportunity to hear you and to, uh, to abide by you. Thank you. So further, I say, uh, take this opportunity to wholeheartedly thank Honorable Lady Justice Madam Sabrina McKenna from the Supreme Court of uh, uh, USA. Madam, you have been, uh, uh, you have spared your valuable time. I understand it's very precious, but you have come here. So uh, in, the, in this evening hours, so we are very much grateful to you. Apart from that, you have very nicely compared the concept of rule of law and access to justice in India and America. So, and, uh, and you have uh, very lucidly and comprehensively brought the different percepts uh, of the uh, rule of law, which will always enlighten us here. And for that, I am I am, I am very much uh, grateful to you that uh, in India, we say with folded hand. So with folded hand, madam, I, I, I thank you. I, uh, I, I will be, I, I express my
in different jurisdiction, particularly on the environmental law and other aspects. Son, you have an intellect on this particular aspects will always remind us thus that we apply it in, uh, in India, we will, uh, we will also up, uh, 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 I am very much thankful to you for being here with us. So again, I am very much thankful Thank to you. you. I convey my regards as well as my thankfulness to you. That this particular webinar on rule of law and access to justice had our honorable Mr. Justice Swadhan Kumar Saha Sir, this is because of your support, your cooperation, your guidance that we are all here. And at high school, you have invited uh, uh, jurists and dignitaries to this particular webinar. So for that, I'm, I'm very, very grateful to you, sir. And please keep blessing at this university so that we can continue with our. Uh, I I convey my highest regard and thankful uh, to Honorable Mr. Justice uh, Kumar Sahab. Authorities could not be present here. That the, the sole reason is that. It, the failure is here and that is why many of our friends and others they could not con connect but yes they have supported us they have cooperated with us and even sometimes guided us also uh, gratitude to law professors many learned law Abroad, I've seen them in the list, sir, sir, uh, and to all the law professionals, able to you that you have come here because of uh, and you have uh, been uh, by the words of our jurists here. So I thank you very much, sir. Further, my, my thanks goes to the uh, to the organizers, especially the two that is our. Uh, uh, our, our my, my, uh, Mr. Um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Abdish Bhatt Sahab and uh, Mr. We have worked very sincerely, dedicatedly with the team spirit to see that this webinar is successful. So I'm very much thankful to you on, on, on behalf of my, the whole university. My thanks are also there to the system has provided us this particular Zoom platform and has helped us proud to see that properly. And now my thanks, I will be failing in my duty if I do not I thank do. my colleagues, other colleagues, staff, and as well as the students, but all other this the, the webinar has been very successful. They are there on the main, most of the students are there on the YouTube. So, so at the end, I thank everyone, everyone. Of, thank you very much. Now, uh, I will request our uh, Swadhan Kumar Sahab that if he, he wanted to discuss something, so we can discuss yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody, please. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, can I request on, uh, okay, can I request uh, Justice Sabina Banker to be on the screen, please? Okay, can, are you Sabina there? Yes, madam, madam is there. Madam is there, just put it on, you people have shut me from the screen, I don't know what do you do. 
अरे अखिलेश जी लाइए हमारे जस्टिस साहब लॉर्डशिप को स्क्रीन पे लाइए यस सर एक्चुअली स्क्रीन पे है अगर बात करेंगे तो सर स्क्रीन पे आएंगे नो माय स्क्रीन शो दैट यू हैव डिसकनेक्टेड मी सर एक्चुअली राइट नो यू आर कनेक्टेड द सब मोबाइल नो नो आई थॉट व्हाई हैव यू डिसकनेक्टेड माय लैपटॉप सर सम इको प्रॉब्लम देन नो आई विल शट द माइक दिस सेल नाउ वंस यू कनेक्ट मी देयर एनीवे जस्ट can you connect me please there yes sir correct sir please join again sir okay sir other participants can leave yes other participants can leave yes please do thank you sir so if you can ask request all other participants all other participants are requested to please leave meeting is almost to meeting is over just we are uh, we are having some discussions with our uh, learned uh, jurist here dear students please leave the meeting akhilesh sir akhilesh ji please yes, ban kar dijiye hamare please ensure that the all our other guest can they should leave it sure sir sure only are the them uh, uh, Sir, can we be present here, Lordship? Sorry, Lordship, uh, can we be here? Well, if you want to be here, I have no problems. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Let me join first. I don't know what is happening here now. Yes, yes. God knows. dear students please 